That's us. Those who have come to Christ since His ministry on earth who constitute His church. Because we will be raptured. The rapture event is clearly a singular event described in the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, John 14. It is a singular event. It describes the snatching away of the church, the catching away of the church. All of us who are in Christ will be caught away. It is uh, the moment when the phrase in Romans 11 is fulfilled, the fullness of the Gentiles. When the church is full, when the last elect person believes, the rapture is triggered. We won't know who that person is, but all the redeemed will be removed. Now when does this happen? Clearly it happens. John 14, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4 describes the event with specific details. When does it happen? Some people think it happens at the end of the tribulation or near the end of the tribulation. I think it happens at the beginning. It has to happen because it's an event. It's an event that has no judgment connected to it, very important. There is no word of judgment in any of those things. That's why our hope is called a blessed hope. So why do I think it happens at the beginning of the tribulation? I'm going to give you a few answers quickly. Number one, in the book of Revelation, which is laid out chronologically, the things which were, the things which are, the things which will be. In the book of Revelation, the church appears in chapter 1 on earth. The church appears in chapter 2 on earth. Seven churches are described in chapter 2 and chapter 3, local churches in Asia Minor. The church is there. Starting in chapter 4, the church never appears again. The Word never appears again in the book of Revelation right through to the return of Christ in chapter 19 and the kingdom in chapter 20. You will never read about the church. It doesn't say anything about the church. It doesn't describe the function of the church. It doesn't speak to what the church does or doesn't do, should or shouldn't do. Why? Everything else in the New Testament is directed at the church. Every, every epistle, all the instruction of the New Testament is directed at the church. Why does all instruction in the book of Revelation to the church end at chapter 3 and you go to heaven in chapter 4 and the war machine of God is beginning to move like it did in Ezekiel chapter 1 and all the rest that flows out of that is void of the church. It talks about the Jews, it talks about the Gentiles, it talks about Jewish evangelists, 144,000, 12,000 out of every tribe of Jewish missionaries, two witnesses. It talks about all of that but never, ever mentions the church until you see the church in heaven at the end. Very important. Church is mentioned nineteen times in the first three chapters and never again up until nineteen when Christ returns. Second, the absence of any instruction or warning to the church about the tribulation. You would think if we were going to go through that, there would be instruction in the Bible about what we are to look forward to, but there isn't anything. It's always a blessed hope. It's always that Christ is coming. It's always that blessed hope and glorious appearing of Christ. We're looking for Christ. We're not looking for Antichrist. It's the blessed hope. Furthermore, if the rapture, which is an event described in Scripture, doesn't occur until the end of the tribulation and believers go through the tribulation, then what's the point? Why go up to come down? Because Christ is coming with His saints. We're going to run into each other. It doesn't make any sense to put a rapture at the end of the tribulation. We go right up and right back down again. Because when you read the rapture passages, they describe that when we go, we go to a place He's been preparing for us and we go to be with Him where He is. He doesn't come to be with us where we are. And we have the married supper of the Lamb and the Bema Sea rewards of judgments that occur during that period of time when we go to be with the Lord. So the rapture would make no sense if it's just whoop, whoop, like that, up and down. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Here's an even more important problem. 
if all believers are raptured at the second coming, if we all get raptured at the second coming, the rapture is a transformation. The dead rise with new bodies. The living have their bodies transformed into a glorious body, like unto His body. So now we're glorified in our eternal state. The question is, who populates the kingdom? You've got an earthly kingdom of Christ. All the sinners have just been destroyed. All the believers have just been transformed. You better be an amillennialist because you can't have a kingdom because there's nobody in it. The only way you can populate the kingdom is to have the church taken out at an earlier time, which makes complete sense with Scripture. Then you have a seven-year period of the greatest revival in the history of the world with the preaching of the gospel, the conversion of a third of the Jews who have become evangelists, the people from every tongue and tribe and nation coming to Christ, saying, worthy is the Lamb, the gospel preached by a flying angel and two witnesses who are resurrected in front of everybody. There's a great mass of people who are converted. When the Lord comes back with His angels and His church, they're still alive. He destroys the ungodly. They are the, sh they are the goats in Matthew 25, and He takes the godly believers who have been converted in that seven-year period into the kingdom. They are the sheep. Come, you beloved of My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. So a post-tribulation rapture leaves nobody for the kingdom. Let me give you another thing to think about, Revelation 3.10. You can look at this, Revelation 3.10. Because you have kept the word of My perseverance, He's talking to His, His true church. Philadelphia and Smyrna were the only pure churches. Remember that? The other five had all kinds of problems. Philadelphia was one of those good churches. This is the true church. You have kept the word of My perseverance. I will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. That, dear friends, is a pre-tribulational rapture verse. You've kept My Word, you're Mine. I will keep you from the hour of testing. First let's start with hour, specific time, specific time, the hour of testing. This is, this is a specific time that is coming to test the world. This isn't some generic, general, all the time testing. It's a specific hour that is coming, an hour of testing. It describes, I'm convinced, the tribulation time which comes to test the world like the world has never been tested and it's going to test the whole world and all those who dwell on the earth. I will keep you from the hour of testing. There's a little Greek phrase, tereo ek, tereo ek. I don't want to get technical with you. Tereo ek means to be kept out of, to be kept out of. That's exactly what it means, to maintain a continuous existence outside of. If you want more detail on that, you can get the commentaries on Revelation. Very important. We'll be kept out of that hour. Turn to John 14. And the, the nature of this is important. In John 14, Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. Well, look, if I thought I was going to go through the tribulation, that'd be kind of a hard pill to swallow? What do you mean, not let my heart be troubled? What's going to happen? I mean, I don't, I don't want to necessarily live under the, the tyranny of Antichrist. I, that's going to be a horrible, terrible time every way you slice it. That's not, that, that's not something you should be fearful of. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe in Me. Here's the good news. In My Father's house are many dwelling places or rooms. If it weren't so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to Myself, that where I am, there you may be also." Where is He? He's talking to His disciples in the upper room on Thursday night. I'm going, and He goes back to heaven and says, I'm coming to take you to heaven. Well, if His second coming establishes His kingdom on earth, and whatever this is takes us to be with Him in heaven, that's two different events, and they have to be separated. And there's no judgment in this passage, and there's no threat. 
And there's no instruction anywhere in the New Testament about how I'm supposed to survive the tribulation, how the church is supposed to survive, how we're supposed to prepare, how we're supposed to endure. There's no warnings. We're going to be with Him and we'll never be separated from Him again. Seven years later, after we've been in the place prepared for us, after we've had the marriage supper of the Lamb, after we've come to the Bema Seat and received our rewards, we'll return with Him in glorified form to meet the saints who are still alive in the kingdom. We'll interact with them as the angels did with the saints in the Old Testament. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Thessalonians 4. The believers in, in Thessalonica were worried about Christians who had died because they were afraid that since they died, they would, uh, they would miss the, the Lord's coming. So He says, I don't want you to be un uninformed about those who are asleep, those who died, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. <laughs> there was this idea that, well, they died, they're going to miss the second coming, they're going to miss the Lord, they're dead. And he says, no, no, you don't need to worry about that. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with them those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Believe me, the dead aren't going to miss His coming. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord won't precede those who have fallen asleep. Not only will they not miss it, they'll come first. And what is that event going to be? Verse 16, the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Of course, they have six feet further to go, so that's the reason. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. We're going to go, that's the same as John 14, we're going to go where He is, He's going to meet us in the air and take us back to heaven. That's the rapture. There's no judgment. There's no punishment. He doesn't destroy the ungodly. He doesn't bring any of the events that are described in His second coming by, by Daniel or, or by himself in the Olivet Discourse, the, the moon doesn't go dark, the sun doesn't go dark, the stars don't fall out of heaven. This is a completely independent event. And it involves only believers. There's nothing about non-believers in this event at all. And this is to comfort us, so comfort one another with these words. How could you be comforted if you're waiting for the Antichrist? How could you be comforted if you're waiting for the tribulation? And furthermore, you, you have to understand that the church is a unique entity. We came into existence at Pentecost, and the church as an entity is gathered into heaven when the fullness of the Gentiles is in. We are distinct from Israel. We sing Revelation 5, the song of redemption. We are even distinct from the tribulation saints. If you look at Revelation 7, we are distinct from the tribulation saints. Israel is unique. The 70 weeks of Daniel are prophesied, 69 weeks from the decree of Artaxerxes to the crucifixion era, and those 69 were pronounced on My people Israel. They were the ones in the 69 weeks that the church didn't exist. And we won't be there in the 70th week, which is that final seven-year period when the Lord finally saves them. That's a unique history for Israel. That's why the Bible says Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God. They are distinguished. Jeremiah 30 calls the tribulation the time of Jacob's trouble. Romans 11, we'll, we'll end there.